Josiah Willard Gibbs was an American scientist who made important theoretical contributions to physics, chemistry, and mathematics. His work on the applications of thermodynamics was instrumental in transforming physical chemistry into a rigorous deductive science. Together with James Clerk Maxwell and Ludwig Boltzmann, he created statistical mechanics, explaining the laws of thermodynamics as consequences of the statistical properties of large ensembles of particles. Gibbs also worked on the application of Maxwell's equations to problems in physical optics. As a mathematician, he invented modern vector calculus. In 1863, Yale awarded Gibbs the first American doctorate in engineering. After a three-year sojourn in Europe, Gibbs spent the rest of his career at Yale, where he was professor of mathematical physics from 1871 until his death. Working in relative isolation, he became the earliest theoretical scientist in the United States to earn an international reputation and was praised by Albert Einstein as the greatest mind in American history. In 1901 Gibbs received what was then considered the highest honor awarded by the international scientific community, the Copley Medal of the Royal Society of London, for his contributions to mathematical physics. Commentators and biographers have remarks on the contrast between Gibbs's quiet, solitary life in turn-of-the-century New England and the great international impact of his ideas. Though his work was almost entirely theoretical, the practical value of Gibbs's contributions became evident with the development of industrial chemistry during the first half of the 20th century. According to Robert A. Millikan, in Pure Science Gibbs did for statistical mechanics and for thermodynamics what Laplace did for celestial mechanics and Maxwell did for electrodynamics, namely, made his field a well-nigh finished theoretical structure, biography. Family background Gibbs belonged to an old Yankee family that had produced distinguished American clergymen and academics since the 17th century. He was the fourth of five children and the only son of Josiah Willard Gibbs and his wife Mary Anna, any acute Van Cleve. On his father's side, he was descended from Samuel Willard, who served as acting president of Harvard College from 1701 to 1707. On his mother's side, one of his ancestors was the Rev. Jonathan Dickinson, the first president of the College of New Jersey. Gibbs is given name of which he shared with his father and several other members of his extended family, derived from his ancestor Josiah Willard, who had been Secretary of the Province of Massachusetts Bay in the 18th century. The elder Gibbs was generally known to his family and colleagues as Josiah, while the son was called Willard. Josiah Gibbs was a linguist and theologian who served as professor of sacred literature at Yale Divinity School from 1824 until his death in 1861. He is chiefly remembered today as the abolitionist who found an interpreter for the African passengers of the ship Amistad, allowing them to testify during the trial that followed their rebellion against being sold as slaves. Early years Willard Gibbs was educated at the Hopkins School and entered Yale College in 1854, aged 15. He graduated in 1858 near the top of his class and was awarded prizes for excellence in mathematics and Latin. He remained at Yale as a graduate student at the Sheffield Scientific School. At age 19, soon after his graduation from college, Gibbs was inducted into the Connecticut Academy of Arts and Sciences, a scholarly institution composed primarily of members of the Yale faculty. Relatively few documents from the period survive and it is difficult to reconstruct the details of Gibbs's early career with precision. In the opinion of biographers, Gibbs's principal mentor and champion, both at Yale and in the Connecticut Academy, after the death of his father in 1861, Gibbs inherited enough money to make him financially independent. Recurrent pulmonary trouble ailed the young Gibbs and his physicians were concerned that he might be susceptible to tuberculosis, which had killed his mother. He also suffered from astigmatism, whose treatment was then still largely unfamiliar to oculists. 
so that Gibbs had to diagnose himself and grind his own lenses, though in later years he used glasses only for reading or other close work. Gibbs's delicate health and imperfect eyesight probably explain why he did not volunteer to fight in the Civil War of 1861-65. He was not conscripted and he remained at Yale for the duration of the war. In 1863, Gibbs received the first Doctorate of Philosophy and Engineering granted in the U.S. for a thesis entitled On the Form of the Teeth of Wheels in Spur Gearing, in which he used geometrical techniques to investigate the optimum design for gears. In 1861, Yale had become the first U.S. university to offer a Ph.D. degree and Gypsies was only the fifth Ph.D. granted in the U.S. in any subject. After graduation, Gibbs was appointed as tutor at the college for a term of three years. During the first two years he taught Latin and during the third, natural philosophy. In 1866 he patented a design for a railway break and read a paper before the Connecticut Academy, and titled The Proper Magnitude of the Units of Length, in which he proposed a scheme for rationalizing the system of units of measurement used in mechanics. After his term as tutor ended, Gibbs traveled to Europe with his sisters. They spent the winter of 1866-67 in Paris, where Gibbs attended lectures at the Sorbonne and the Collège de France, given by such distinguished mathematical scientists as Joseph Leoville and Michel Cazals. Having undertaken a punishing regime of study, Gibbs caught a serious cold and a doctor, fearing tuberculosis, advised him to rest on the Riviera, where he and his sisters spent several months and where he made a full recovery. Moving to Berlin, Gibbs attended the lectures taught by mathematicians Karl Weierstrass and Leopold Kronecker, as well as by chemist Heinrich Gustav Magnus. In August 1867, Gibbs's sister Julia was married in Berlin to Addison Van Name, who had been Gibbs's classmate at Yale. The newly married couple returned to New Haven, leaving Gibbs and his sister Anna in Germany. In Heidelberg, Gibbs was exposed to the work of physicists Gustav Kirchhoff and Hermann von Helmholtz, and chemist Robert Bunsen. At the time, German academics were the leading authorities in the natural sciences, especially chemistry and thermodynamics. Gibbs returned to Yale in June 1869 and briefly taught French to engineering students. It was probably also around this time that he worked on a new design for a steam engine governor, his last significant investigation in mechanical engineering. In 1871 he was appointed Professor of Mathematical Physics at Yale, the first such professorship in the United States. Gibbs, who had independent means and had yet to publish anything, was assigned to teach graduate students exclusively and was hired without salary. Unsalaried teaching positions were common in German universities, on which the system of graduate scientific instruction at Yale was then being modeled. Middle years Gibbs published his first work in 1873, at the unusually advanced age of 34. His papers on the geometric representation of thermodynamic quantities appeared in the Transactions of the Connecticut Academy. This journal had few readers capable of understanding Gibbs's work, but he shared reprints with correspondents in Europe and received an enthusiastic response from James Clerk Maxwell at Cambridge. Maxwell even made, with his own hands, a clay model illustrating Gibbs's construct. He then produced three plaster casts of his model and mailed one to Gibbs. That cast is on display at the Yale Physics Department. Maxwell included a chapter on Gibbs's work in the next edition of his Theory of Heat, published in 1875. He explained the usefulness of Gibbs's graphical methods in a lecture to the Chemical Society of London and even referred to it in the article on diagrams that he wrote for the Encyclopaedia Britannica. Prospects of collaboration between him and Gibbs were cut short by Maxwell's early death in 1879, aged 48. The joke later circulated in New Haven that only one man lived who could understand Gibbs's papers.
that was Maxwell, and now he is dead. Gibbs then extended his thermodynamic analysis to multiphase chemical systems and considered a variety of concrete applications. He described that research in a monograph titled On the Equilibrium of Heterogeneous Substances, published by the Connecticut Academy in two parts that appeared respectively in 1875 and 1878. That work, which covers about 300 pages and contains exactly 700 numbered mathematical equations, begins with a quotation from Rudolf Clauses that expresses what would later be called the first and second laws of thermodynamics. The energy of the world is constant. The entropy of the world tends towards a maximum. Chibs's monograph rigorously and ingeniously applied his thermodynamic techniques to the interpretation of physico-chemical phenomena, explaining and relating what had previously been a mass of isolated facts and observations. The work has been described as the principia of thermodynamics and as a work of practically unlimited scope. Wilhelm Ostwald, who translated Gibbs's monograph into German, referred to Gibbs as the founder of chemical energetics. According to modern commentators, it is universally recognized that its publication was an event of the first importance in the history of chemistry. Nevertheless it was a number of years before its value was generally known. This delay was due largely to the fact that its mathematical form and rigorous deductive processes make it difficult reading for anyone, and especially so for students of experimental chemistry whom it most concerns. J. J. O'Connor and D. F. Robertson, 1997 Gibbs continued to work without pay until 1880, when the new Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland offered him a position paying $3,000 per year. In response, Yale offered him an annual salary of $2,000, which he was content to accept. Later years from 1880 to 1884, Gibbs worked on developing the exterior algebra of Hermann Grassmann into a vector calculus well suited to the needs of physicists. With this object in mind, Gibbs distinguished between the dot and cross products of two vectors and introduced the concept of dyadics. Similar work was carried out independently, and at around the same time, by the British mathematical physicist and engineer Oliver Heaviside. Gibbs sought to convince other physicists of the convenience of the vectorial approach over the quaternionic calculus of William Rowan Hamilton, which was then widely used by British scientists. This led him, in the early 1890s, to a controversy with Peter Guthrie Tate and others in the pages of Nature. Gibbs's lecture notes on vector calculus were privately printed in 1881 and 1884 for the use of his students, and were later adapted by Edwin Bidwell Wilson into a textbook, Vector Analysis, published in 1901. That book helped to popularize the DEL notation that is widely used today in electrodynamics and fluid mechanics. In other mathematical work, he rediscovered the Gibbs phenomenon in the theory of Fourier series. From 1882 to 1889, Gibbs wrote five papers on physical optics, in which he investigated birefringence and other optical phenomena and defended Maxwell's electromagnetic theory of light against the mechanical theories of Lord Kelvin and others in his work on optics just as much as in his work on thermodynamics. Gibbs deliberately avoided speculating about the microscopic structure of matter, which proved a wise course in view of the revolutionary developments in quantum mechanics that began around the time of his death. Gibbs coined the term statistical mechanics and introduced key concepts in the corresponding mathematical description of physical systems including the notions of chemical potential, statistical ensemble, and phase space. Gibbs's derivation of the phenomenological laws of thermodynamics from the statistical properties of systems with many particles was presented in his highly influential textbook Elementary Principles in Statistical Mechanics, published in 1902, a year before his death. Gibbs's retiring personality and intense focus on his work limited his accessibility to students. 
His principal protege was Edwin Bidwell Wilson, who nonetheless explained that, except in the classroom I saw very little of Gibbs. He had a way, toward the end of the afternoon, of taking a stroll about the streets between his study in the old Sloan laboratory and his home, a little exercise between work and dinner, and one might occasionally come across him at that time. Gibbs did supervise the doctoral thesis on mathematical economics written by Irving Fisher in 1891. After Gibbs's death, Fisher financed the publication of his collected works. Another distinguished student was Lee de Forest, later a pioneer of radio technology. Gibbs died in New Haven on April 28, 1903, at the age of 64, victim of an acute intestinal obstruction. A funeral was conducted two days later at his home on 121 High Street and his body was buried in the nearby Grove Street Cemetery. In May, Yale organized a memorial meeting at the Sloan Laboratory. The eminent British physicist J. J. Thompson was in attendance and delivered a brief address. Personal life and character Gibbs never married, living all his life in his childhood home with his sister Julia and her husband Addison Van Name who was the Yale librarian, except for his customary summer vacations in the Adirondacks and later at the White Mountains. His sojourn in Europe in 1866-69 was almost the only time that Gibbs spent outside New Haven. He joined Yale's college church at the end of his freshman year and remained a regular attendant for the rest of his life. Gibbs generally voted for the Republican candidate in presidential elections but, like other mugwumps, his concern over the growing corruption associated with machine politics led him to support Grover Cleveland, a conservative Democrat, in the election of 1884. Little else is known of his religious or political views, which he mostly kept to himself. Gibbs did not produce a substantial personal correspondence and many of his letters were later lost or destroyed. Beyond the technical writings concerning his research, he published only two other pieces. A brief obituary for Rudolf Clausus, one of the founders of the mathematical theory of thermodynamics and a longer biographical memoir of his mentor at Yale, A. Newton. In Edward Bidwell Wilson's view, Gibbs was not an advertiser for personal renown nor a propagandist for science. He was a scholar, scion of an old scholarly family, living before the days when research had become research. Gibbs was not a freak. He had no striking ways. He was a kindly dignified gentleman. E. B. Wilson, 1931 According to Lind Wheeler, who had been Gibbs's student at Yale, in his later years Gibbs was always neatly dressed, usually wore a felt hat on the street, and never exhibited any of the physical mannerisms or eccentricities sometimes thought to be inseparable from genius. His manner was cordial without being effusive and conveyed clearly the innate simplicity and sincerity of his nature. Lynn Wheeler, 1951 He was a careful investor and financial manager, and at his death in 1903 his estate was valued at $100,000. For many years he served as trustee, secretary, and treasurer of his alma mater, the Hopkins School. U.S. President Chester A. Arthur appointed him as one of the commissioners to the National Conference of Electricians, which convened in Philadelphia in September 1884, and Gibbs presided over one of its sessions. A keen and skilled horseman, Gibbs was seen habitually in New Haven driving his sister's carriage. In an obituary published in the American Journal of Science, Gibbs's former student Henry A. Bumstead referred to Gibbs's personal character, unassuming in manner, genial and kindly in his intercourse with his fellow men, never showing impatience or irritation, devoid of personal ambition of the baser sort or of the slightest desire to exalt to himself, he went far toward realizing the ideal of the unselfish. Christian gentlemen, in the minds of those who knew him, the greatness of his intellectual achievements will never overshadow the beauty and dignity of his life. H. 